Hey, what's good? Uh, it's been a full year since I last said I was gonna try to come back to YouTube. Uh, I'm gonna try again. <laughs> I hope you believe me this time. I'd like to welcome you to Alex's Shit Show, a show where I show you shit. That's a working title. I don't know about you all, um, but I've been having a huge, huge amount of trouble getting myself to watch anything new during quarantine, which is so frustrating for me because I, I used to be really good at breaking out of my own media comfort zone. I think it's important to have a varied media diet and I thought, what if I designed a YouTube show around that, that idea? Not that it's a revolutionary thing to like comment on media on <laughs> YouTube, but like specifically the idea of like, I just want to show you some shit. You know, I, I know about a lot of things that I, I don't see discussed a lot online. That's everything from, you know, like actual movies and books and stuff to videos off of the internet archive or like a sick ass leaf I found. Hold on, hold on. A sick ass leaf I found. Uh, let's do something with that. You know, let's mess with the format. Let's try some, try some shit. Let's, uh, I may uh, have to change that title <laughs> if I get demonetized. I don't know, maybe I'm being like a petulant child, but I, I feel like it's so bizarre to be on a YouTube where you have to censor yourself. What a shitload of fuck. Oh, fuck, we're dumbasses. We'll fuck her. That's right, we'll fuck your wife. You know, I think censorship uh, sometimes serves a purpose, right? But like, Specifically, the idea that you can't curse uh, is just asinine to me. I get that the new ad standards mean that we're not gonna get any more like uh, Logan Brothers style suicide pranks, um, and it makes it like nominally harder for hate groups to, to uh, spread their message, but like, I feel like historically those, those hate groups have been very good at sanitizing themselves and like just adapting to changes in the system. So like why bother at this point? If some diet Ben Shapiro dude can come on here and like make a veiled statement about how women belong in the home or whatever, um, I should be able to, I should be allowed to cuss as much as I want and I should be able to say that I'm happy that Ronald Reagan died in pain. Um, okay, okay, I'm, ge I'm getting a little too intense too quickly. Um, today, I'm gonna talk to you about a very special movie, about a very special mouse, who we all know and love. Not that one. 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 If you're only here for that main topic, uh, just go ahead and skip to it. I'm gonna do a little table of contents with uh, timestamps next to them. After that main section, we're gonna have a little intermission. We're gonna have a, then a heart-to-heart -heart <laughs> discussion uh, over some food. And then we're gonna end with a reading group. Uh, <laughs> I would really like it if you stayed for the reading group, but you don't have to. But before we get into all that, um, I would like to tell you about a game I've been playing lately. Okay, so um, yeah, Super Monkey Ball 2 is not an obscure game. A lot of people play that game, but I never touched it before because I always thought of it as being like, this super mega hardcore gamer, like high skill floor ar arcade bullshit. You know, I'm a born again casual gamer. Um, <laughs> I used to be hardcore, but then I found Christ. But I'm so glad I uh, took a chance on this one because uh, it's really easy to get into. The difficulty curve is so smooth, like more so than I've ever seen for a game this like technically complicated. The pacing too is amazing. Like I was worried it would just be all like kind of gauntlet um, obstacle courses, but the thing that they do, the thing the designers do, is they make the machinery of the levels a puzzle that you have to solve in some of the stages, where you're just trying to figure out how to exploit the physics system of the game to navigate around these, like, kind of contraptions. And that, uh, that added so much longevity to it for me. And that's not even touching on the amazing collection of minigames that comes with, like, that you have to unlock. It's so well done, and God, God, God damn. If I, if I could invite someone over to my house, you know I'd be playing these couch co-op, but I can't, and it's, it's heartbreaking. So it's a good game. I, I say if you find it cheap on, uh, online, like take a chance on it if you have a, a Wii or a GameCube. Um, only other thing I want to touch on is the cutscenes. I've always been a huge fan of like, uh, GameCube PS2 era cutscenes, um, in games that like have no business having a story. Um, but this game really awakens something in me. The only way to, to add a story to a game like this is to just make up some whack shit and commit to it 100%. That's the kind of storytelling that I'm attracted to. <laughs> and God, it's so good. God, it's so it's so stupid. Um, the uh, 
they just like take some like slice of life anime archetypes and like stick them uh, in monkey balls and just have them like fly around and like go in a volcano and stuff. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna get into the meat of it now. Um, I want you to prepare yourself mentally and spiritually. I want you to listen to me very fucking closely and attend to every single word I'm about to tell you. All right. Only one live action Chuck E. Cheese movie has ever been made. Um, <laughs> I don't even remember where I found it initially. I, it was something weird. I wanna say it was like TV Tropes. <laughs> remember TV Tropes? <laughs> that shit was weird. All right. So this is a movie, this is a movie. Are you listening? Okay, this is a movie where Chuck E. Cheese, our beloved friend, and all of his uh, animatronic buddies, uh, they're out at an Italian restaurant having some authentic Italian food, and they decide to beam themselves to an alien planet uh, so that they can earn 50,000 US dollars for a small child's farm, worst character in the movie, by participating in an intergalactic F-Zero style death race against two German guys, or maybe Austrian, uh, uh, who are participating in like a massive doping scandal. And this next part is crucial, okay? I'm speaking, I'm speaking directly into your ear right now. This movie, this film, is a musical. All right, not just, not like a Chuck E. Cheese musical. I mean like a, a Broadway musical with full numbers, it's got a villain song, it's got a reprise, and the entire thing is fully freely available on YouTube. You can see how difficult it's been for me to sit on this shit, right? Now, I'm not gonna do the whole, um, you know, YouTuber thing where I like break all the fun scenes down beat by beat, um, because then you're not gonna watch the damn movie. Uh, and I want you to watch the damn movie, but I will give you some highlights. If you're the type of person who's into like, ironic, nostalgia, hate watching, you'll get a kick out of this movie. Um, especially if you're like specifically into sort of late 90s Phantom Menace era green screen kitsch. Um, but I genuinely love this type of shit. Um, if you know me, you already know this. Like not, not a lot of irony coming from me on this one. So what do I like about this movie? Like why do I like movies that are like this? Well, the writing is a big factor, to be honest. You can tell the writers are having fun, but it's also kind of low effort, uh, <laughs> which I like. And like I said, it's like, this story shouldn't exist, but they hired a bunch of people to justify its existence, right? That's kind of what a lot of these brand movies are like. Um, and you know, there's like a, a cynical way to look at that, but it's already been made. I'd rather just have fun with it. And, and acknowledge the fact that this is like kind of a hollow product. But you know, it's doing like the kind of uh, 90s live action cartoon thing you see a lot in, you know, that era of children's media. Um, and the characters are weird. All right, so like Chuck E. Cheese is written like, kind of like if, if Sonic was written as an adult, like just a normal guy, uh, <laughs> instead of like kind of like nebulously being an anime teenager or, or sort of, uh, I, I don't know what Sonic, how old is Sonic supposed to be? That's fucked up. I have no idea. But no shit. I mean like Chuck E. Cheese, it's, it, he has like the, the 90s cool thing going on, but like he just reacts to shit like a normal guy, um, which is just the weirdest thing to watch. The only race this thing is gonna win is against a cross-eyed turkey with a sprained ankle. Come on, Jasper. It's not that bad, I guess. This 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 mouse is a red-blooded American male. I mean, like, something I had to come to terms with watching this movie the first time is that Chuck E. Cheese fucks. Okay? Ooh. Hi. Ooh, Chucky! <laughs> Do you guys know where the racers hang out? Oh, uh, hey, um, well, uh, uh, we're racers and uh, uh, we're hanging out right here. <laughs> Don't worry, I got it. No, no, I got it. Yeah, wait, I didn't know that you were taken. Oh, you mean Helen? Oh, wait. she's just a friend. You know, she's like one of the guys. <laughs> this movie is a little too horny for me, which again is not uh, abnormal for like this era of children's media for whatever reason. 
there's this weird uh, love quadrangle thing between uh, Chucky and the bird lady and the two Austrian racers and a racer groupie, a human woman. And the Austrian guys uh, steal this human woman from him. And it's, it's very sexually charged in a way that I'm not really a fan of. And I wish I had like, you know, a joke for this, but I, I really just, nothing comes to mind. I wanna uh, circle back to those Austrian guys for a second, uh, cause they're, they're just easily the best part of the movie. Um, you know, it's kind of a basic cartoon dumb guy duo. And the, like the two, uh, you know, goofy Austrians is like a very tired um, comedy trope, but like they do it pretty well. They, these actors are obviously having a lot of fun. And I saw a lot of YouTube commenters like comparing it to was it Hans and Fritz from 90s SNL. And like, I don't know, man. Has SNL ever been funny? I'm starting to second guess myself on that. Full offense to Dana Carvey. Uh, <laughs> these guys are like funnier than any of those sketches, honestly. And the, these bit actors in this Chuck E. Cheese movie. But you wouldn't hit a lady, would you? <laughs> sure. Yeah, a yeah. lady, a doggy, whatever. But these characters' main purpose in the movie is to um, illustrate the message, which is kind of an anti-cheating, um, you know, don't sell your health away or your, um, your selfhood away for a chance at success. And that's a good message, right? Like, <laughs> that's, that's pretty standard fare for a kid's movie. But um, it kind of goes off the rails uh, when they, they choose to illustrate that theme by revealing that these guys are, are literally doing performance enhancing drugs, right? They, they're doing this drug called Zoom Gas. And I love this because Zoom Gas functions identically to like that cyberpunk slow motion drug from from the Judge Dredd reboot. Do you remember that? And the best part is like it functions way more in this narrative than it does in that movie because it actually serves a purpose in the race, right? It slows down their perception of time so they can make it through like a, a really difficult end leg of the race and it like gives them a head high and improves their focus. And you better bet your ass there is an entire musical number devoted to this plot point. And it's it's a banger. It's the best one on the soundtrack. Unfortunately, uh, the the guys only get to do backup on this, but uh, Dr. Zoom is the, <laughs> the the main vocalist and he does he does a pretty good job. How could you be so blind? Zookas, 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 just a squirt in your face! If you forget to like, comment, subscribe, and click the bell, you, you will, be, will reduced be reduced to, to juice. juice. I fucking love this movie, dude. I don't wanna to say too much more. Um, There's still some fun stuff that I haven't talked about. It's only an hour long. I mean, you might as well, like if, if from this video, you think you would like this movie, you probably would like this movie. So just watch it. I think hindsight is like an important factor in enjoying uh, Chuck E. Cheese and the Galaxy 5000. I like not nostalgia. I mean, hindsight specifically movies like this from the 90s to me are way more charming to watch now that like every blockbuster is shot like this against a green screen set. I might get some hate for this, but like I think Chuck E. Cheese and the Galaxy 5000 has more of a visual identity than any Marvel movie. <laughs> and that's by virtue of it being old and janky and underfunded, right? But like still say what you will about this movie, but um, like the animatronic uh, fursuits are not bad. And overall, I think Chuck E. Cheese has more of a tangible screen presence in this movie than, you know, any action scene where like CGI Chris Evans is like weightlessly bounding across the roofs of cars in fake New York. I'm not against CGI at all. Uh, you know, I just think that you have to be trying to do something aesthetically with it <laughs> that is like, more involved than just photorealism. And you don't need like state-of-the-art shit to make um, an aesthetic statement with uh, with CGI. Like, have you ever seen, okay, I can't really recommend this movie, but uh, the, have you seen the 90s Spawn movie? I've never read a Spawn comic in my life, but like the CG in that movie has aged so well. They lean into kind of like the rough polygonal look of early CGI and they, they run with it and it works. Again, I can't recommend Todd McFarlane's Spawn, uh, but uh, you should at least, if you're like into movie criticism, you should at least read Roger Ebert's review of it. It's very funny. He loved it. I was turned off by Spawn, and ultimately I was 
bored by Well, Spawn. I dismissed the story basically because I wasn't interested in it, <laughs> and like all comic book stories, it's a loop anyway because there has to be a sequel, but I thought this was an extremely interesting movie. Really? It was also, like, John Leguizamo just straight up plays Wario in that movie. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> like, did they cast him because because he played Luigi in in a different movie. This clown guy, did you enjoy all the flatulence jokes, all the gas bag jokes and all that stuff? Yeah, that was part of the whole thing. This that's guy funny is to supposed you? to be... That's funny to you? In your life, that's funny? funny, Gene. It's not oh. that it's funny. It's that it's part of his personality. He's an extremely obnoxious and hateful little creature. Okay, what, what was I talking about before I got on Spawn? Um... Right, so what I'm saying is uh, Galaxy 5000 has a visual identity. It's pretty rough, but like, you know, some of these uh, CGI sets and interiors are kind of interesting to look at. I mean, this like kind of, um, you know, space mess hall type thing has a kind of a fun arcade carpet pattern that is appropriate for a Chuck E. Cheese movie. It has like weird stained glass windows and space age furniture and stuff. And again, this is like a lot of this charm has to do with time passing, but like, do you think that hindsight will be as kind to like the Avengers movies? What aesthetic is there to like draw out of that? It's hard for me to imagine uh, like people 30 years from now fetishizing the look of, of Marvel movies. Not that, I mean, okay, a couple more movies have like good looking effects. To be clear, I'm not trying to actually like shit on Marvel movies. There's a couple that I genuinely like. I'm not a Francis Ford Coppola stan. But I do think they represent a lot of things that are wrong with Hollywood right now, and I just, I just wish. Because the movie is in a disreputable genre, I think you're not looking at the real achievement. Wait a minute. I just l said I like the first Batman movie, and particularly, I, it's not disreputable, it's how it's done. And you're comp comparing the visual style to Bach? Well, good luck. Greetings, fellow star children. I have come here to this place between places to deliver arcane, fifth dimensional truths that go unheard by those with mundane, earthbound ears. Remember, we all come from stardust, and to stardust we shall return. Okay, okay, uh, <laughs> hear me out. I wanted to finish off my discussion of Chuck E. Cheese in the Galaxy 5000 with uh, the debut of a new segment uh, called The Prophecy of the Week. I consider myself something of a soothsayer, if I may say so. Uh, and no, but for real, there have been a few times in my life where I've made weirdly specific and accurate predictions about the future of pop culture. Not a long resume, I can only think of a couple examples and I have no proof. I wanna try doing this full time. Like I could be the, the Cassandra of like shitty internet stuff. Today I'm gonna to make a prediction uh, related to Chuck E. Cheese and the Galaxy 5000. I feel like it's almost inevitable that like artsy kind of film school, art school kids are going to make indie movies that look like this, right? That look like Chuck E. Cheese and the Galaxy 5000. I, that's not the prediction even. I think it's pretty inevitable because like, even if it's just in a couple minor subculture spaces. Just think about like, number one, how available the technology is. You know, green screens and uh, video editing software. I've already seen these design aesthetics in like kind of some weird places, like fashion videos and shit like that. Um, maybe it's already happening and I'm just ignorant. I haven't really been caught up with like <laughs> artsy pop culture in at least two years. Not to mention quarantine, right? Like making other kinds of film production almost impossible. If I'm wrong and no one else makes this kind of stuff, then, then I'll just do it and make my own prophecy real. Um, this is pretty transparently like one of those predictions that I'm making because I want it to come true. But uh, that's not even the prediction. That's not what I'm getting at. What I think is going to be the problem with these kinds of movies is that none of them are going to nail the tone, right? They're either going to be way too self-serious, trying to tell like a really emotionally resonant story with the visual language of kids' brand media, or it'll be way too irreverent and self-referential, making a big deal about how it's the 90s and that's really funny and cool. It'll be way too easy to do that because the further and further away you get from the original uh, 
point of creation for a piece of entertainment, um, the more appreciation for it is going to be purely aesthetic. Honestly, I think the, the oncoming wave of like 90s nostalgia reinterpretations is gonna be really messy, or at least it's gonna take some really clever people to do it in a way that works. Cause like 80s media, right, it's like very, pulling from very basic elemental storytelling tropes and stuff like that in a way that is easy to reproduce. When I'm thinking about it in my own mind, I feel like the nostalgia cycle um, for any given decade, it starts with like callbacks and references. Then you get to like reboots and you know, kind of spiritual successors and things. And then you end up with pastiche, right? And that's what Stranger Things is. That's the kind of thing that you, um, that I think leaves the most cultural impact. And like, how are we going to make pastiches of 90s media. It's really funny to me that like older cultural commentators will try to characterize you know the culture of the last 10 years as being especially remix focused because the 90s were all about that shit. I, everything in the 90s is a pastiche. <laughs> this. You ever seen that show Cops? I was watching it one time and there was this, this cop on, he was talking about. So how are we gonna have like a bunch of like 25 year old kids making pastiches out of pastiches? I, I honestly feel like uh, people my age and younger are gonna have a very hard time understanding the, the actual cultural roots of the motifs and story beats and you know stock characters that make up 90s media, the stuff that we grew up with. And I'm, I'm including myself in that. There have been many times when I come up with like uh, a take on a piece of media from my childhood and then go and do the research and realize I was totally off target because the stuff they were working off of and referencing, it was outside of my, my cultural sphere. And that doesn't have to be a bad thing. You know, my, my disappointment with a lot of like nostalgic 80s callback movies and stuff is that they have all of the exact same problems as the 80s movies they're referencing. If we have to fucking go through this nostalgia thing over and over again, which I think, I think that's just what happens, then I hope that at least engages with the politics of the time that it's looking back on and points to a new way forward instead of just, you know, making an escapist fantasy out of the past. That shit's hard to do, so uh, I feel like it's gonna be a train wreck and we're gonna see some fun stuff, and that's my prophecy of the week. Dude, wow, that was pretty exhausting. Um, I, I feel like I'm not really acting like myself on camera, which I know is normal for YouTube and I'll probably get used to it as I get reacclimated to YouTube, but I don't know, I need a cool down or something. I need a break. Um, do you wanna go for a walk? Okay, so I wanted to have like kind of a chill uh, oversharing discussion segment uh, after the main one, but I don't know, that sounded kind of like dull and self-indulgent to me. So I thought maybe I should combine it with like a mukbang, which for those who don't know is like eating on camera for an extended period of time. <laughs> so if you want to pause the video right now, grab a snack or something, come back and eat with me, now would be the time to do that. Um, I was gonna like go to a local restaurant and pick something up, but um, my county just imposed like mega lockdown restrictions, so uh, <laughs> not gonna fuck with that. I've got a bowl of lentil soup instead. Um, and I'm gonna do my very best not to talk with my mouth full. I know I've had trouble with that in the past. Feel free to call me out. I thought the subject could be um, YouTube today and the uh, my <laughs> fears and misgivings about coming back to YouTube. It's weird to be back on here. You know, I said that before. I don't know, I t I'm taking it more seriously this time because I just have so much open time right now that I'm not spending on anything worthwhile. Like, <laughs> I I even have, I'm lucky enough to have a part-time job that I can do remotely and I still have a ton of open time. 
I'm thinking I could manage to upload like as often as every other week. I mean, that's how I want to start at least. I, <laughs> I'm not a fast worker. And to be honest, if this doesn't work for me or if it's not coming out the way I want it to, I might just give up. That's not like impossible. I want to be clear about that. And I also want to be clear that like, I'm not attached to this format at all. Like, maybe a little bit, but um... Oh, fuck my battery, man. All right, well my stupid camera died, so I'm <laughs> on my phone now, sorry. There's, I mean, there's stuff I love about YouTube and there's a lot of shit I hate about YouTube. I think that's, that's normal. Uh, it's just like, I can't shake the feeling that this platform has so much potential. Don't you ever get a craving to like start a cult or something? I really, I think YouTube might be like the only creative career I could actually like feasibly have a shot at that I would actually enjoy doing, <laughs> which is also fucking scary considering like video editing is pretty much my only marketable skill. And the prospect of like advertising in my videos makes me uncomfortable, but I mean, mama's gotta eat. <laughs> I do think um, I'm gonna try doing sponsorships at some point. Like, and I think this would actually be a good segment to put them in, especially if they're all food related and I could just eat them talking about something else. And I don't know, ideally I would be able to phase that out over time. I don't know, man. There's like, there's this naive, stubborn part of me that like still really believes in sort of the utopian dream of the internet. Is there some way we can, we can make that happen within the context of, of YouTube as it exists today? I feel like there must be, I don't know. I don't want to like, <laughs> I sound like a camp counselor or something. Like I'm obviously not changing anything, uh, making sex jokes about <laughs> a direct to VHS 1999 brand movie. I, I don't really know what I'm doing here. <laughs> I don't know why I'm back on YouTube, but I do know that I, I missed making stuff like this. I missed, uh, you know, sharing my thoughts about stuff. Dumbass stuff, <laughs> mostly. And you know, um, it feels good to be back. <laughs> I guess that's actually all I wanted to say. So yeah, if you've actually watched this far in the video, um, thanks. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping we can have a little, little journey together. Okay, so it's finally time for the reading group. Um, technically, not a real reading group because I didn't assign you any like reading homework. But maybe in the future, if people do want to read with me, I could actually find stuff that's available to read online and we could talk about little sections of it or something. Is that like too much of a youth pastor idea or is that a good idea? But today I thought I'd just end with uh, reading from a, a book that I like. Um, it's called Invisible Cities. It's a book of prose poetry by a, a cool Italian guy. And if you don't know what prose poetry is, it's just prose is like any writing that is not poetry. So it's like poetry written in a non-lyrical style, which I think makes it a lot more accessible. And also like, you don't have to be into poetry to, to get something out of these poems. Like they're, uh, the imagery they use is really striking and cool. And the themes that it explores are spelled out pretty explicitly. It's a little bit heavy handed sometimes actually. Imperialism and uh, memory and desire and nostalgia, which I think is pretty relevant to um, Chuck E. Cheese. The gimmick of this book is that each poem is a description of a fictional city. I think it would be fun to just talk about it a little bit. It's dubious copyright wise to be just reading a part of a book, um, but I think if I talk about it enough that it'll constitute fair use. So yeah, I'm gonna get a little bit pretentious here. I, I, hope, you, I hope you're into it. You can rent it on the Internet Archive uh, with a free account if, if you want to read some of this. <clears throat> This one is called Trading Cities One. Proceeding, <clears throat> Proceeding 80 miles into the northwest wind, you reach the city of Euphemia, where the merchants of seven nations gather at every solstice and equinox. The boat that lands there with a cargo of ginger and cotton will set sail again, its hold filled with pistachio nuts and poppy seeds, and the caravan that has just unloaded sacks of nutmegs and raisins is already cramming its saddlebags with bolts of golden muslin for the return journey. But what drives men to travel up rivers and cross deserts to come here is not only the exchange of wares, which you could find everywhere the same in all the bazaars inside and outside the Great Khan's empire, scattered at your feet on the same yellow mats, in the shade of the same awnings, protecting them from flies, offered with the same lying reduction in prices. 
You do not come to Euphemia only to buy and sell, but also because at night, by the fires all around the market, seated on sacks or barrels or stretched out on piles of carpets, at each word that one man says, such as wolf, sister, hidden treasure, battle, scabies, lovers, the others tell, each one, his tale of wolves, sisters, treasures, scapees, lovers, battles. And you know that in the long journey ahead of you, when to keep awake against the camels swaying or the drunks rocking, you start summoning up your memories one by one, your wolf will have become another wolf, your sister a different sister, your battle other battles, on your return from Euphemia, the city where memory is traded at every solstice and at every equinox. So that's a, that's a decent one. I, I they don't really get into the description of the city very much, um, which is too bad because that's an aspect of this book that I like. I could see how to the wrong reader this could come across as like fake deep, right? But <laughs> I like the idea that our memories are kind of like a shared cultural object made up not only of our, you know, actual lived experiences, but also the stories we tell ourselves and others about our experiences and then mixed with uh, experiences that people have related to you, right? It's it's very social, it's very uh, collaborative. It's it's bizarre, it's fucking weird. That's what I was thinking about last time I watched Chuck E. Cheese and the Galaxy 5000. Okay, well that was fun. Uh, I hope I hope you liked this video. Uh, I already reminded you to do all the YouTube stuff, so I guess I should just be done now. Mm -hmm.